Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, The Lessons of Europe, in which we're going to explore the Holy Russian Empire going back to where it all began. Even with the death of the regent, the remnants of Daddy Tabby's legitimate government endures under the rule of Viktor Larionov in the old imperial town of Vyatka and the surrounding lands. With the assistance of his Shlomoviki, he has proclaimed himself blessed regent of the Holy Russian Empire and purged his opposition, protecting the imperial cult within his borders. As Daddy Tabby before him, Larionov believes it is his divine mission to reunite the empire and prepare the way for the return of the rightful monarch, though his commitment to Alexei specifically is dubious, however. His lack of manpower limits him, and means that he shall always be a mere pariah, pariah king, pariah, kingdom of raiders and thieves. <clears throat> uh, even though uh, it says Vyaka, but our capital is Siktivkar currently. It is what it is, right, Victor? The definition of insanity. Victor Larionov is getting old. He could feel it in the creak of his bones when he got up from his bed, and the supreme effort that had come that accompanied tasks that were done without thought some years and ages ago. When he was younger and wiser, his current predicament certainly did not aid matters. The everyday administration of what little remained under his control is proving to be a gargantuan task. Tabaretsky, may God have mercy on his soul, have left no instructions for a successive region most days. Larionov found himself close to cursing some of the administrative decisions that his predecessor had made in the name of the Tsarevich. While they were surely decisions made for the benefit of Holy Russia, Larionov made a more often than not, found himself putting up fires left over from the foibles of the previous administration. A sudden crash of thunder from outside the window of his bedchambers caused the aging man to jump to his feet in fright. With a muttered swear, he wobbled over to close the window that had been thrown open by the wind panting from the exertion of walking across the room. He slid down the wall, coming to a rest on the floor. A sudden idle fancy struck him. Perhaps they would let him abdicate? It was clear that he was in over his head. Surely the others could see that. He would simply retire from politics and let someone more competent take up the reins. His sudden hopes were dashed as quickly as they had appeared. Of course, they wouldn't just let him leave. He knew too much, had seen too much. No, it was more than likely that they could, that they would simply kill him for daring to admit that things were any less than perfect. With a soft groan, he placed his head into his hands and began to sob. The regent endures with national spirits. Ooh, Imperium Nihilus. We have 30, minus 35% stability. And there's no benefit. Hermit Kingdom, pretty good. Assaulted Earth, as well as some black market trading, and apparently they were doing some industry. Wow, look at that. That's a lot of, uh... That's a lot of research slots. Oh, Daddy Tabby's regent. Uh, Castle of Snow. Did you hear about what happened to Border Post 052B? Valery Oleggiavich sat down his spoon with a sigh. Though his status as a captain under the Stromoviki allowed him the privilege of eating in the officer's mess, he tended to make his meals alongside his men. It was something he figured was good for morale, and he did truly care about them. The downside, of course, was that he rarely got to eat his food in peace. Andreev! You know what the region says about gossip, he responded. Andreev was a good boy, really. Earnest in a way that a lot of new recruits weren't, and halfway competent with a rifle. Valerie had noticed a general decline in the competence of the new faces in his regiment. Some tried, and some just couldn't hack it, though he could tell that many more were in it simply for a paycheck and a warm bed. He missed the old days, where they fought for the preservation of the Russian race. Andreev's face fell flushed a bit at the dis chastisement. I don't gossip is a tool of the devil, I know, but this is too big not to tell, he said. Olaf told me that he heard the entire outpost got wiped out by partisans. What? Valerie asked. Incredulity, plain in his voice. It's true, the entire garrison there is just gone almost to the man. This would never have happened under Daddy Tabby, but now that Larinov is in charge... Shut it, Valerie hissed. Do you know what that kind of talk will get you? A one-way trip to the gallows, that's what. Stop talking about this and tell your friend Ola that if he knows what's good for him, he'll keep his mouth shut too. Suitably chastened, Andreev turned back to his food and muttered apologies. Valerie wondered if he had been too hard on the lad, though he knew what he had said was correct. The higher-ups would never allow such talk to fester, though truthfully, he found himself starting to think along the same lines. It's a shame he was such a promising recruit. Burgundian system, we have ultra-nationalism under Gumilev, despotism under Daddy T Tabaretsky. He's still not dead, no matter what anyone says. He's not dead, and of course, the Burgundian system, the best system under Larionov. A one-party state? State religion? Very cool. Elite voting? Oh, yes, please. But, the waters of Leth. When Antonin Odoyev was offered the position of secretary to the blessed region, he had been told over and over again how much of an honor it was. You'll have direct access to the region's holy words. They would say, the closest to God in Alexei. If he were being honest, he didn't know anything about being close to God, but 
Antonin took a certain pride in his work. He helped the region with what he could, and it quickly became indispensable to the day-to-day -day operations of the state. The pay wasn't half bad either, which was nice. A grandfather clock that sat at the edge of his little office struck nine. Its dolorous chime startling him from his work. Letting out a soft groan, he stretched his arms, feeling each pop as his tired joints settled back into place. Antonin had recently started saying, staying later at his office, helping the regent with whatever he needed done. He was getting rather worried about Larry now, actually. The regent had recently been overtaken by palsy. His mood was stiff and shaky, and day by day he was growing into less of a person that Antonin had once so admired. More than once, he found the blessed regent wandering around his office, muttering confusedly to himself, and would need to be gently reminded as to what he was supposedly to be doing at any given point in time. Larionov was growing forgetful, which meant Antonin needed to stay on his toes more than ever. Grabbing his coat, Antonin walked out of the cool night air of Vyatka. He wasn't a doctor, but he knew in his gut that there was something seriously wrong with the regent. Perhaps it was just stress? He could only hope it was nothing more serious. As so before, so it shall be. Exploitive... Exploitative taxation, flat taxes though, acceptable minimum wage, child labor is illegal, oh no, 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 penal slavery, outlaw, traditional roles, state oppression, ooh, and preemptive security, creaking timbers. Victor Larinov didn't recognize the strange room that he'd woken up in. None of it was familiar to him. His hands shook as he tried to untangle himself from the unfamiliar bedsheets. His mind stuck in a haze as he glanced furtively around. The region could feel his heart pounding out of his chest, his breathing heavy. With an agonizing slowness, he got up from the unfamiliar bed, reaching for a pistol hidden in the unfamiliar nightstand. A knock on the door broke the silence of the room, and the regent's eye snapped towards the sound. Slowly, he brought the pistol up to bear, the weapon trembling in his grasp. The doorknob turned, and a young man poked his head in. Good morning, regent, he said. Warmth in his voice, I hope you slept well. Who are you? The regent interrupted, turning the pistol on the intruder. The young man blanched, stepping through the door with his hands raised. What? Where have you taken me? Don't you know who I am? Spittle flew from his lips as his voice grew louder with every proclamation. I promise that your death will be agonizing. It's just me, Antonin, your secretary. The young man said, his voice shaking. He took a cautious step forward. Regent, are you well? Do you need me to send for a doctor? Stay away, Lorenov screamed, cocking back the hammer and gesticulating wildly. Don't come any closer, or I swear I'll shoot. He saw the young man's eyes flick to something behind him before he was tackled to the ground. The two men wearing security uniforms were standing over him. Whirping the gun away from his hands, get a bad word, doctor, now, he heard one of them shot. The young man in the doorway fled, presumably to fulfill these orders, but the regent didn't care. The world grew dark, and the blessed regent wept like a child. The beginning of the end, even though here, in society, our academic base, research facilities, agriculture, industrial equipment, ex industrial expertise, and army professionals are all increasing. Ex unfortunately, though, actually even poverty, too. Only our nuclear stockpile is not increasing. A little disappointing, but everything else is doing quite well, my friends. Quite well. And we should have one more event. Eclipse. The grim look on the face of the doctor told Antonin all he needed to know about the prognosis of the Blessed Regent. It had been taking no small time or to find a doctor after what had been referred to in hush whispers as a palace as the incident. Most doctors had fled Viaca some time ago, and the, only the bravest, or perhaps the most foolish, reigned. There's not much more I can do, the doctor said, his voice tired. He had been in the room with the Regent for some time. He's comfortable, I can say that much. Do you know why it happened? Antonin pleaded. The doctor shrugged. Could be anything. Stress from overwork. Dementia. It doesn't really matter. What ma does matter is that he's confined to his bed. He won't be able to govern, of course. Of course, the secretary replied. Thank you, doctor. Antonin nodded to two of the Stromoviki posted along the wall, and they grabbed the doctor by the arms and escorted him from the room. The doctor would be killed, of course. It would never go. It would never do for the people to learn that a second regent had gone the same way as the first. With the room now empty, Antonin walked over to his desk, sinking into the chair with a sigh. He wasn't stupid. He knew that what was going to ha what was happen to the doctor would soon happen to him. He was nobody important, just a secretary who knew too much. He would meet his end in the minute the rest of the ministers learned of what had happened. Unless a certain thought struck him, his eyes shot open. Did the ministers have to know? It wouldn't be that unusual for the region to become suddenly reclusive. Secrecy was quite common in the empire, after all, and he could forge all the sign signatures necessary. Antonin's mind was a blur. He let out an almost panic laugh at the thought. It could work. It would work. It had to work. There's still so much to be done. All right, my friends. So here we are with the last set of events to get to the epilogue for After Midnight. Spring. On a cool spring morning, as the uh, Rasputitsa passed, one might have recently seen an unusual and unsettling sight amidst the rising stalks of verdant grass and the life-giving soil of the motherland. There lay a dead man. What clothes he wore in life were reduced by the elements to nothing more than discolored scraps, small bits and baubles made of gold, silver, and gemstones, hid beneath a layer of dirt. 
taking the appearance of mere scrap and pebbles. The skull's hollow eyes betrayed nothing of the life that had once danced within their windows. Whatever heart previously beat within the broken ribcage had long since rotten away to nothing. Whether it had been withered and black or vibrant and full of love was of no consequence. The ring set upon skeletal fingers could have meant anything. Such was their burnished state, and yet was it truly so frightening a sight? Whoever these old bones once supported, they were but dust in the wind, and a name consigned to memory. Whatever the dead man had done in life, he was gone now. Anything terrible that could have been attributed to him, no matter how awful, was in the past. Whether or not he had been consigned to a particular afterlife, his mortal form was no more. Someday, the bones, too, would be reduced to nothing. They would be eroded by time and whim, and no more would their presence perturb the motherland's peace. This, too, shall pass. <clears throat> Of course, we still have later enough here, but beyond. Decades hence, two souls trudged along the banks of the river Ab. They would have looked strange indeed to any who had resided there in the past, with their thick rubber boots coated in black mud and crinkly foreign-made jackets that protected them from the chill wind. Clear, said one, consulting a slim, flat screen held in their hands. Incredible, that's Mother Nature for you, I suppose. Not just her, replied the other with a gentle smile. We were busy while you were going up and down the country, taking your samples and poking you around in the dirt. Astounding what a lot of determined people with shovels can do. At first grinned as they stowed away the, the screen in a pouch. Of course that was your idea. Well, the point still stands if you consider humans to be part of nature. Same difference. In the end, replied the other. Point is, it's clear, clear poison. Clear of death, clear of... They paused for a moment, melancholy filling across their features. Clear of everything. Free, purified. God, I, I can hardly believe it, you know. The melancholy passed, yet moisture dab in their eyes. The first clapped the others on the back. It's safe. We made it that way. You, me, the others, and the motherland herself. The taint didn't last, just like everything else he built. The first released that they too were weeping. Overcome, the pair embraced. Against all odds, after all the horror and suffering and deprivation, it was over. Life had found a way. Flee from the night. And we'll get another event. The motherland is pure from her poison. <clears throat> There'll be another time. It was a height of summer, but the water lapping at the docks was still frigid as was the wind blowing down the North Pole. The woman shivered and drew her thick coat tighter around herself, turning south the face away from the icy gale. Zaya wasn't much better, but at least it was the warmth of home and hearth. How long has it been, she murmured, gazing southwards across the rooftops of Aurora built Arkhangelsk. How long indeed when... She Last, she walked the European side of Russia. The world was a very different place. Computers were the size of refrigerators back then. Now, a device with countless times of processing power nearly fit neatly into the palm of her hand. Not to mention how much the land itself had changed. She felt the memories rising unbided. They were always there just below the surface, scratching at the walls of the prison for so long they had ruled her. It had taken so many years of effort to... She shook her head. Dispersing the whispers, she, they didn't rule her anymore once, but never again she lived as Russia lived. The Empire, the Stromoliki, the origin, they did not. They had been unable to pretend or prevent her escape across the shattered lands of Siberia. They held no power here, or there, nor in a muir where she had found a home, nor over her still beating heart. Like the Malone, Svetlana was free. Scarred, broken, grieving, but free. She placed a hand upon the railing and began a long trek to Sicknif car. Time heals all wounds and washes away hatred. In a distant future, let it all become faded. The end, my friends. That is the final one for the midnight. Or after midnight. post tabby collapse. Now... With this end stuff, we can enable sandbox mode, sandbox mode, Russia slumbers, the survivors of Daddy Tabby's reign of terror cast an un uncertain, turbulent future of the, the still remains of a faded dream. Yet we can't help but imagine what if. Note, all events that happen during sandbox mode are not a continuation of the story, and neither will be added upon in future versions of the game, nor considered canon. Be sure to pick the country you want to play as before picking this decision. So if we want to do that, oh, we can just go ahead and just straight just straight go to war with other people, which is pretty cool. So let's say we want to go to war with the Imperial Mercantile Committee, or is it committee? Imperial Mercantile Committee? Yeah, yeah. Consortium. So we go straight to war, and I've actually organized all the forces appropriately, and they have five divisions. And if we wanted to, we could probably reunify everyone here all together if we really wanted to, but let's just take them out and see what happens, just for funsies, shall we? And of course, the North will never rise again. Uh, too poison for anything. Uh, guys, would you like to continue moving on? That'd be very nice. Maybe we just take them out real quick and see what happens. I do love the purple of Larian of the of Larian's Holy Roman Empire. It's very, very nice. Kostrama, ah, Kostrama. Very good. And they have capitulated. But if you enjoyed the video, and if you enjoyed reading, seeing, and hearing about all the different warlords and a post-tabby collapse, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. 
Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.